You know, first and foremost, PNT uh, Project Sexton was a study in PNT resiliency. When we think about resiliency, there's a lot of ways to define that. Uh, what we did was we framed it in terms of, of really three critical elements. The first is how to protect PNT services from outages, whether it's caused by uh, natural phenomena or man made threats. Uh, the second element was to address uh, options for flexibility and cost of the constellation and being able to provide PNT services. And then the third element was, is there a way that we can uh, introduce new technologies faster? Again, that, that sort of harkens to the idea of providing more options for PNT. So that was, that was the intent of, of the uh, Project Sexton. Uh, and what we did was we focused on the strategy. Uh, what we learned was a few things. The first thing we learned is we did an exercise to look at all the different options for providing PNT, obviously starting with GPS, uh, and working our way down to things like inertial uh, optical sensors, opportunistic nav. Uh, and when we looked at all these options, we came to the conclusion that uh, we really couldn't find a single what we call drop and replacement for GPS. We couldn't find a system, a single system that provided the same level of satisfaction, the same range of applications, uh, the same performance. Uh, that wasn't some variant of radio navigation from space. So I think that was a critical affirmation of not only the general sentiment within the community, but several key studies that had happened prior to Project Sexton. Uh, the other key element, I think, of the, of the project was this idea of looking at the strategy. Uh, I think there's a shared vision within the PNT community. Certainly, uh, we came upon this from our internal study. Uh, a vision of the future in which users have more flexibility in how they can integrate different sources of PNT into a single user device. Uh, it could be multiple sources of GNSS, or it could be uh, combinations with inertial and other types of sensors. Uh, there's a tremendous amount of work happening in the autonomous vehicle area that may be able to contribute some PNT sources. Uh, perhaps not at the same performance as, as GPS, but certainly when combined together, has the uh, advantage of flexibility that speaks directly to resiliency uh, and options. So the strategy we came up with was to take uh, essentially an open source approach to creating a, a device platform. You can think of this platform as a combination of hardware, software, and open standards. And the idea is with this platform is that uh, you encourage more developers to create PNT applications. Uh, and this mirrors what we've seen happening in the tech sector over the past decade. Uh, with those options and with those developers, if they target specific parts of the existing PNT user base uh, with specific business cases that, for all intents and purposes, are there to generate revenue, uh, we think then those are the key ingredients to form a, a PNT ecosystem in which we expect to see accelerated growth not only in the options that are available, but the market tested services. Uh, that, will, that will come from creating such an environment. Those all provide resiliency back not only to the everyday PNT users, but also to the DoD uh, in terms of those uh, flexibility options that I mentioned earlier. Yeah, the Aerospace Corporation is a federally funded research and development center. We were chartered in 1960. Uh, the key characteristics of an FFRDC is that we're unbiased. Uh, that we're free from conflict of interest. Our role uh, at aerospace, our primary role is in the mission assurance and mission success of satellite systems, primarily for the Air Force as well as the intelligence community. Uh, and in that role, we provide technical excellence, uh, risk assessment, and also work hand in hand with our customers uh, on a variety of satellite systems. So the work we do with the Air Force is a critical element of their enterprise when it comes to satellites and rockets. Uh, in the case of, of GPS, we have folks who are co-located with the SMC GP directorate, uh, and then we're very closely across the entire life cycle of the GPS program, as well as in uh, just about every element, everything from the satellite system to the ground to the control segment, system engineering, as well as the users. Oftentimes, uh, much of the work we do for the GPS directorate uh, comes from uh, then asking us to look at things to do a technical assessment or support some activity uh, or task that they have. In the case of Sexton, it's unique in that this was funded internally by aerospace leadership. They wanted to take a 
uh, sort of a different look, if you will, at the idea of PNT resiliency. Project Sexton was chartered by our executive vice president, Dr. David Gorney. Uh, and what he asked us to do was to look at PNT resiliency and to look at, at it broadly uh, and to think about uh, potential options for the future uh, if we want to think about how to make PNT more resilient. The, the intent of the study was not to replace GPS. Uh, it wasn't to augment GPS. It wasn't to try and modernize GPS, but to think more broadly about how we get our PNT. Uh, and then to think about if, if there's a strategy for how we can make it more resilient. Uh, there's significant activity that's happening within the directorate uh, regarding the resiliency of the constellation, and Ram and Tom can give you a lot more details about what those are. Uh, but the study was specifically asked to look uh, in a completely different direction to see if we can come up with a different strategy for how we can address the resiliency issue. And I think with Sexton, you'll find that, in fact, uh, we have come together and put together the pieces for how you can think about integrating uh, a wide range of PNT options to include GPS in a more resilient way. The development cost of new PNT technologies uh, is now distributed across multiple providers. You have more options that have been market tested and that have been optimized for a specific set of the user base. All those are, I think, uh, benefits back to the DOD, back to the government, back to the broader PNT community. And we're seeing similar transformations happening in the electronics area in terms of how the electronics industry has evolved based on consumer electronics driving a lot of that market, uh, and the DOD seeing benefit from that. Uh, and then you can draw other parallels in, in other industries. So we just took those uh, sort of looks at how the business model has evolved and tried to apply it to PNT, and that's ultimately what Sexton focused on and, and came up with. synergies exist with what is already being done by the directorate and, and it is quite synergistic uh, as, as you know the directorate has been very involved in modernizing GPS and so we have uh, been deploying a number of modernized capabilities new signals uh, M code L2C L5 L1C and we work with many other PNT uh, providers and uh, and forms to make sure GPS remains protected and that its performance is continually maintained and improved. Uh, and so um, that, that's what the, the main activities of, of the directorate are. So for example, we're engaged in forums, international forums, one of which is sponsored by the United Nations called the International Committee on GNSS, where we meet with other GNSS providers to make sure that LONAS, the Russian system, Galileo, the European system, Beidou, the Chinese system, and other regional systems play well with GPS. And that furthermore, the end user can develop applications that can track all of those uh, systems and services in, in as seamless a way as possible, which is synergistic with what uh, Project Sextant's findings were. Um, and beyond GNSS, we also look to make sure at in, in areas like spectrum, that as new services are coming up, that they are not going to adversely impact GPS, especially if they might be candidates for PNT. So we protect the spectrum for GPS and for other GNSS. Whether it is uh, from satellite systems or, or communication systems, um, cell phones, etc. Absolutely. Um, I know. Um, uh, we're fortunate enough to deal with Brad Parkinson, who was the first program director of GPS, 
And if you've ever had the chance to see him speak publicly about some of the history of it, he emphasizes very clearly that in his very, initial, very first dealings with Congress and others, he emphasized that this is a dual-use system. Um, also, the previous commanders of U.S. Air Force Space Command have held things like Civil Focus Day, where they uh, invite civil stakeholders to come in and they demonstrate that they are committed to maintaining GPS as a dual-use system. So it's, it's very clear to all of us that GPS is a dual-use system. Um, I'm also fortunate enough to be involved in the PNT Advisory Board, which uh, is part of the PNT Executive Committee. And that Executive Committee is co-chaired by the Depart Deputy Secretaries of Defense and Transportation. And so that's a very um, uh, real demonstration that this is a dual-use system because it's DOD and DOT. And um, the board works to make sure that GPS services are preserved and um, toughened. They have, a, they have a three objectives, what they call PTA, protect, toughen, and augment. And so that's to protect the services, to toughen um, the receivers to make sure they're more resilient, and to augment them as necessary to make the service more robust. Services were doing quite a bit of R and D in that area. In fact, your, your geodetic, uh, geodesic background, you probably know that the Army had a program called C Corps, where, that, where they were exploring exactly the same ideas, uh, and uh, the, the Navy was also doing exploratory work with time nation. Time nation. Yeah. And the Air Force got in the fray. They had their own needs for uh, satellite-based navigation. And so they started a program called Program 621B in about 1964. And at that time, the president of aerospace had the foresight to commission a study. He, he formed a team of aerospace engineers and he said, I want you to go and look at all the different options for doing satellite navigation. Do you compute the uh, position of the satellites on the ground? Or do you have the receiver compute them? Do you have um, a very accurate clock in the receiver, or do you have just a regular crystal oscillator? Do you do two-dimensional positioning or three-dimensional positioning? Do you have a passive signal or an active two-way signal? And that generated many different options, and Aerospace went off and studied, I think, more than 12 different options, and they came up with a recommendation, and that recommendation was the foundation of GPS. The GPS architecture today is exactly I think it was called option 12, that was recommended by the aerospace study. That study is known as the Woodford-Nakamura study, uh, or the Woodford study. And it was classified for the longest time. It, aerospace did play an important foundational role in what ca came into being as GPS. And of course, Dr. Parkinson played it a crucial role. And he, he, he was the uh, chief engineer, the program manager for, the, for uh, program 621B, and he was the one who got buy-in uh, from DOD to actually um, get the GPS program uh, underway and, and funded, and buy-in from all the different services, and that was no small feat. we're doing quite a bit of, of work with NASA uh, in their pursuit of human exploration, including Mars. So we've been involved in, in several studies for them. Uh, we also continue to support some of their efforts, including on the launch side.